Social Cognition, Part 3, excellent. All right, so uh, in this final part, I'm going to talk about some effects that we found building on Parts uh, 1 and 2 a little bit. So, uh, and my choice of topics in social cognition is based on what I consider to be important, but also what we're going to use later on in the semester. And uh, when we get to the chapter on the self, uh, you know, this about mood and memory is going to be very important. So, there are two effects. Uh, on uh, memory based on affect or mood uh, that we should be aware of in social cognition. And the first one is uh, getting my pen, mood-dependent memory. And this is when memories are more available, that it's easier to remember memories if the mood of the person, uh, if the mood the person was in when the memory was made is congruent with the person's current mood. Now, if you think about that definition for a second, what that means is if you're in a good mood right now, you're going to remember good times and good things. Because that's, you know, you're going to remember the memories of when your mood was congruent, which means when you were in a good mood in the past. Likewise, if you're in a bad mood now, you are going to be more likely to remember bad things in the past or, or times when you were in a bad mood. So the dependence is that there's this congruence between memory when the memory was laid down and recall mood as you are right now. And then there is the mood congruent effects, uh, which is people notice and remember information which is congruent with their current mood. And so if you're, this is more of a, not a memory effect, uh, but a current, uh, you know, effect. If you're in a good mood, you notice positive things or good things. For example, people who are happy is a positive thing, so you're going to be more likely to notice people who are happy. If you're in a bad mood, you're going to be more likely to notice sad people. If you're in a good mood, you're going to be more likely to rem you know, remember something positive, like you won $2 in the lottery. And if you're uh, in a bad mood, you're going to be more likely to remember something negative, such as like, oh, oh that afternoon I stepped in dog poo or something like that. So that's uh, the mood congruent effects is more to do with whether or not uh, you know, you're in a good mood or a bad mood makes you notice and remember certain things more. And also heuristics. This is more a topic that I just like to talk about. Uh, and we're going to go directly to that topic in a minute. But uh, the textbook talks about the cognitive miser uh, and really what the cognitive miser is about is what I mentioned last week. Consciously we are only able to th you know to uh, attend to two or three explicit tasks uh, and so generally our minds work as a cognitive miser in that we want to not spend any effort on things that we don't have to because we want to save that effort, that cognitive effort, for uh, things that are important to us. And so because our conscious uh, effort is so limited, our minds are going to shunt or move a lot of things that we're doing to implicit or unconscious processes because the effort there, it doesn't matter they're effortless and the capacity is limitless. And a couple examples. One example is schematic processing. Uh, when people are be acting like misers and they're focusing on important things consciously, they will do things unconsciously or implicitly according to schematic processing. And also they're more likely to rely on heuristics. A heuristic 
is a simple rule for making judgments. And the textbook talks about availability and anchoring. And I like to talk about representativeness. Uh, so please allow me to indulge myself. I'm the professor here, so I think I, I'm allowed to do that. But, uh, you know, the textbook describes the representativeness heuristic or the simple rule for making judgments uh, under representativeness as we attribute characteristics of a category to a, a person based on how well they match the prototype of that category. And so if somebody matches the prototype of a category well, we say, oh, they must be part of that category, so all the other things we know about that category should apply to them. Uh, and let me go to this example first. Uh, so there's a uh, sexist uh, stereotype or schema that we have about Karens nowadays. You know, and uh, so let's talk about that schema or that category Karens. So who is more likely to act like a Karen? Who is going to be more likely to want to speak to the manager or speak with your manager? And here we have, this is the original Karen, even though her name is not a Karen. Uh, but uh, she has the traditional Karen haircut. So this is what I mean by uh, they fit the prototype. They look like the uh, ideal Karen. Uh, Isabel here does not. So according to the representativeness heuristic, uh, if we're acting like a cognitive miser and allowing our unconscious to make decisions, we would say that she would be more likely to want to speak to the manager. That is, we're ascribing the characteristics of the category, speaking to the manager, based on the fact that she meets the prototype so well. So that's the you know, normal way that we use the representativeness heuristic. And if you think about it, what the representativeness heuristic is saying is something pretty powerful. I mentioned that Karen is a negative sexist stereotype. What if we talk about racial stereotypes? And yep, what we're talking about with the representative heuristic is pure and simple racism or s racial stereotyping. I see a black person, and if I'm working based on the representativeness heuristic, what's going to happen is if they match the prototype and they have black skin, so they do, I'm going to attribute all of the characteristics in that schema to that person. And what that is, is racism. And so to clean up this slide a little bit so I can move to another point. I have to do, nope, nope, come back. I have to do pen twice again. Whenever I erase, I have to do pen twice. Why is that? Okay, so uh, I said that if you're acting like the cognitive miser, you're going to make this, you're going to use the representativeness heuristic. But if you're not, if you're thinking consciously, and I say, hey, who is going to be more likely to want to speak to the manager? Consciously, you're going to say, what do you mean? Like, looking at a picture doesn't tell me anything about what the person is like. And that's absolutely true. And that's a really important difference between a cognitive miser and thinking consciously. You're more likely to think logically when you're thinking consciously, but you're more likely to, uh, you know, think along the representativeness heuristic and think according to your schemas or schemata, excuse me, when you're uh, busy with other things. And so if you're thinking about it and thinking well, you're, then you're saying, so that means people are more racist when they're not really paying attention to what they're doing and that's absolutely right. They're more likely to act on their racist, racial stereotypes and schemata uh, when they're not paying attention to what they're doing. But I said another way, or I haven't yet, so I'm going to do it now, another way of defining the representativeness heuristic is like goes with like. And what do I mean by that? Uh, by like goes with like, what I mean is when we say that, well, if somebody matches the prototype, they are like 
that category so they should have the same characteristics and what we're talking about here is boiling down the representativeness heuristic to its basic uh, components which is just assuming that you know uh, things that look like something are that thing and so the the statement you know if you look like a snake and walk like a snake you are a snake like goes with like uh, that leads to and some psychologists have talked about how we can apply the representativeness heuristic to conspiracy theories so we look at situations which have generated uh, massive conspiracy theories and other situations which were almost as earth-shattering but developed almost no conspiracy theories. For example, uh, the 9-11 attacks on the United States and the JFK assassination uh, have de you know, developed massive conspiracy theories with people, uh, you know, most people in the United States believing in part some part of these conspiracy theories. But the fact that Ronald Reagan was almost assassinated uh, early on in his presidency uh, but survived, that has developed very little little of a conspiracy theory following, uh, which is really odd in that, man, this whole Reagan attempted assassination thing is really weird. And, you know, it, it should be really good fodder for conspiracy theorists. That is, the guy shot President Reagan because he was lo in love with the actress Jodie Foster, and he thought that if he shot Reagan, Jodie Foster would have sex with him, and, well, that's just messed up. And, I, you know, why are there not conspiracy theories about that? Why are people, after like 50 years, still absolutely bonkers about the JFK assassination? Uh, and, well, the explanation goes, like goes with like. That is, big goes with big. So therefore, if something has a big impact, it should have a big cause. And so, when we look at the 9-11 attacks, that does have a big impact. That is, a uh, couple trillion dollar, uh, you know, damage to the United States economy. Uh, it changed, really, the politics of America and security in America, even up until today. Uh, the uh, type of militarization of the police that was caused by the 9-11 attacks we're starting to see the fallout of that uh, in terms of what the Black Lives Matters people are talking about the militarization of the police and how that's affecting how the police respond to African Americans. Uh, the JSK assassination, a big of impact. Uh, you know, we lost you know a president that we loved. So therefore, since the impacts are big, the causes have to be big. Uh, what causes? Uh, technically, the 9-11 attacks were orchestrated by about 25 people uh, overall, and estimates go to 25 to 50. 20 were involved in the actual attack, probably 50 support people, and also probably it was less than a million dollars to fund. So that's a very, very trivial cause, if you think about it. So, you know, about 50 people get together with like a half a million dollars and they take down the United States to such a degree, that doesn't go together. But the fact that there's this secret, you know, cabal of the CIA and other people and Israel and blah, 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 you know, and this huge, you know, explanation and people were working in the Twin Towers for months ahead of time, preparing it for the explosive demolition. Oh my God. Well, that's just crazy talk, but that's the power of like goes with like. And, but also on the flip side, little goes with a little. And so, even though there's really good fodder for a lot of good, you know, conspiracy theories about Reagan's assassination, the impact was minor. 
uh, he was in the hospital, it was you know a very severe wound, it may have impacted his stamina for the rest of his presidency, uh, but he was still president. So with a little impact, we accept the fact that, yeah, some lone person who was insane or mentally ill decided to do this. But of course, the same exact situation was what happened with the JFK assassination. But again, the impact was big, so the cause cannot be little. The cause cannot be one person who kind of is goofy with a gun. It has to be this big conspiracy theory of Castro and the Mafia and the CIA and the Illuminati and whatever. And so uh, when we look at this today with uh, you know the uh, COVID pandemic, like like goes with like, the pandemic is causing a huge impact. And so, you know, well, what's the cause of it? And people, some people can't seem to get their minds around the fact that this virus uh, is what's causing it. And so they bring in all these other things, these, you know, there's a pandemic and there's, you know, other things involved. Uh, and this, I really think, is a very interesting application of the representativeness heuristic. Okay, Im okay first impressions. Uh, so let's clear our palettes. Uh, uh, and I can tell you a little anecdote about this. Uh, you know, so you're at a cocktail party. That's the uh, stereotypic the set setting. And people will say, well, what do you do? And if you say, I'm a social psychologist, you'll get things such as, you know, most of the responses are, ooh, I guess you're analyzing me right now, and which is a smart-ass response. Or uh, a more honest and educated response is, oh, so like Milgram's experiment, do you shock people in your experiments? And then I have to go and uh, explain to them about Milgram and everything, which is kind of boring. Sometimes I don't want to deal with it, so I just say I'm a teacher. <laughs> but uh, other times, uh, but uh, another social psychologist, her deal was if she was uh, stuck talking to somebody that she doesn't like, and they say, so what do you do? And they say, oh, you know, and she says, I'm a social psychologist. And they say, oh, what do, what do you do uh, with that? And she would look them in the eye and tell them, I study how people make first impressions. And that usually shuts them up because we're all concerned about making first impressions. And in fact, social psychology uh, you know, says that we should be because first impressions are important and they are long lasting. Uh, that is the first impressions that is the first set of beliefs or things that you think about someone uh, are long-lasting and they're difficult to change. Uh, we see that when we look at the uh, belief perseverance effect. Uh, this states that beliefs such as first impressions, that is th I think this person is a nice guy or I think this person is a complete loser, beliefs remain even if the evidence uh, even if evidence is presented which refutes that belief. That is I see somebody, I think they're a nice guy for whatever reason, and then I get information later on about how they're horrible, I really don't change my belief that they're a nice guy, even though I know that they're horrible. I have all this evidence that they're horrible. Let me give you an example. Uh, so I went to, to high school with a guy, uh, Tom Riley, and he was, you know, kind of weird. Uh, you know, back in the 1980s, uh, or the 70s actually, which was high school for me, uh, you really wouldn't have like a Nazi flag in your basement, but he did. He really liked the Nazis a little bit too much. And, uh, you know, so, uh, and, you know, he always talked about Nazis and, and you know, he was, you know, kind of scary. And I always wondered what happened to him. And then on Facebook, you know, it said, suggested friend, Tom Rowley. And so I was snooping around. I didn't friend him because he was too freaky. And he had, like, you know, kids. And I'm saying to myself, oh, my God, you know, this freak has kids. What the hell did he do, you know, in terms of raising his kids? Okay, so, uh, actually, all that I told you about Tom Riley is a lie. 
Uh, I did go to high school with Tom Riley, but all the Nazi stuff was just an outright lie. But now, ref reflect upon your feelings about Tom Riley. Do you feel positive about him, negative about him? Most people feel negative about him. Why? Because p belief perseverance. You created an original belief about him, and that belief is relatively disassociated with any evidence that I can now present to you. And even though I just told you that everything about him that I told you was a lie, you still have that original bad feeling about him. And this hacks for people or specific situations. Uh, for example, one real life example of this is induendo or exact or accu accusations when you accuse somebody of something or you spread gossip about them. You know, for example, uh, after Camilla, uh, Kamala Harris uh, was announced as the vice president, uh, you know, Twitter exploded. Well, you know, she she says she's black, but she's really not black. She's a liar. And almost immediately, you know, Twitter was cor corrected, and, and people explained what her uh, ancestry was, but then that original accusation, uh, Kamala Harris is a liar, that exists, and people probably still have that bad taste in their mouths, even though the fact that, you know, that rumor that she was a liar has been disproven with evidence, people probably still have that negative evaluation of her, and that's the belief perseverance effect. Bear Weightlifter again. You're going to remember Bear Weightlifter. Okay, and then also, uh, and we're getting close to wrapping up uh, you know, this lecture, but uh, the self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, another way of describing self-fulfilling prophecies is beliefs create reality. In that, not only uh, will you perceive things based on your belief or you'll act in ways which will only allow you to get information that confirms your belief but you will actually cause real life changes in reality which will in reality confirm your belief for example Rosenthal and Jacobson in back in 1968 did the classic study uh, they gave uh, elementary school students a IQ test at the beginning of the year, and they told the teachers, oh, uh, based on our IQ test, this student has a high IQ, and they're just going to really do well uh, this year, uh, so keep an eye on them. Or they told the teachers, this student has a low IQ, and they're really not going to do well at all. And actually, that was... A lie. Uh, they just randomly assign students to the two conditions. The condition where they tell the teachers that the student is going to do well that year and the condition in which they tell teachers the students is going to not do well. So uh, then at the end of the year they gave the, the students an actual IQ test and believe it or not the students who were randomly placed into the group that said they were going to do well that year did and the students that were randomly placed into the group uh, where the teachers were told they were not going to do well, they had a lower IQ. What was going on? Wow. Well, what happened was the teachers heard that Sally is going to do really well this year. So what do you do as the teacher? Well, Sally's a smart girl, and so I want to focus on her to help her as much as I can. And so you do. You change the way you're paying attention to the students based on that original belief. And Larry is kind of dim, and the you know all the help you could give him is not going to help him. So you kind of pull back from him. You don't help him out as much as you could. And in fact, not only did the IQ test tell you that he was kind of dim, but you know, look at him, he looks kind of dim. And so you don't help him that much. And that's how beliefs in Rosenthal's experiment creates reality. And in social psych, uh, you know, uh, Jones, Edward E. Jones, of course, talks about how uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy uh, plays out, where 
you know, you have the perceiver and the target. So as this sounds familiar, it is, the perceiver has a tentative expectation. I'm told this person is friendly. And so then uh, the target person behaves ambiguously. It could be seen as friendly or not friendly. Uh, both types of behaviors. However, we have uh, the perceptual confirmation. Oh, he seems friendly. And so what do you do when you're acting with a friendly person? Well, you act nice and friendly towards them. You trust them. Uh, you're polite to them because that's, you know, this is somebody who's going to respond positively to it. Well, if you uh, all of a sudden are treated nice by somebody, how are you going to respond? You're going to respond warm and friendly also. And so now we're starting to see the behavior change. And then we have behavioral confirmation. See, I was right. He really is friendly. And how far can this go? Well, if those expectations are held by enough people, the target's uh, you know, uh, personality could change or self-concept could change because everybody's treating them nice and friendly. And so it's encouraging them to be friendly and they look back at themselves and say, hey, you know, I'm just a friendly person. And so it's amazing how the self-fulfilling prophecy could actually change the way a person behaves and thinks about themselves based on how other people think they should act. And that's a very powerful idea and a very scary idea if you think about it. And uh, let's see, yep, finish up these two ideas and then we'll be done. Uh, I listed the negativity and optimistic biases. Hey, cognition, get choose one or the other. Are we optimists or pessimists? Well, we're both. There's a negative negativity bias. And where's my pen? There's my pen. Uh, come on, pen. Uh, the negativity bias uh, refers to our tendency to notice and remember negative information over positive information. And this is more pronounced when we're processing implicitly, that is unconsciously. And this occurs mainly during perception and also putting things into memory. So when we're perceiving things, especially automatically, we're likely to notice negative things more uh, and to be aware of those things more. However, we have a tendency to believe that we are more likely than others to experience, experience positive things. This is the optimistic bias. We think that we're also less likely to experience negative things. Uh, so if you ask me, what's my chances of having a heart attack during my lifetime? I would say, well, not that great, like uh, better than average. In fact, there's a better than average effect people think that they're better than the average person in terms of whatever they do. Which, you know, if you think about it, everybody can't think that because then what's average? Uh, this is mainly explicit and it mainly deals when we're talking about our self-perceptions, that is, how we think about us. Uh, so these are ways to distinguish oops, there we go the negativity bias from the uh, optimistic bias, explicit versus implicit, and perception versus self-perception. And now finally, counterfactual thinking. Uh, what is counterfactual thinking? It's thinking what might have been, that is, mental representations of alternative pa pasts. Uh, people do this a lot. And we do this pretty much automatically. Counterfactual thinking is when we think of what could have happened. And when we create counterfactuals, that's what we call them, counterfactual past that could have happened, uh, either the past is worse than the real one, or either the past is better than the real one. And so let's take a look at downward comparisons first. And where's the, no, 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 go back, go back. 
well that screws up that but where come on come on come on there we go uh, downward comparisons are when the alternative paths that we create are worse than the real ones and this down process of downward comparisons is the normal mainstay of coping uh, and doing it makes people feel better uh, you know survivors of horrible things they often say they often create downward comparisons and for example Katrina survivors they say well at least I didn't die I had my home destroyed uh, my neighborhood and my community I lived in my entire life was destroyed I was moved to a FEMA trailer in Oklahoma and I never went back to, to you know New Orleans ever again uh, you know but it could have been worse I didn't you know I'm still alive I have all my arms and legs I didn't die so because of this they feel better about themselves and again everybody who lives through anything can say well at least I didn't die so they can always have something to say I'm not really the worst off ever there are some positive things about my situation and then we have upward comparisons where our alternative paths are better than the real ones these usually make us feel sad about ourselves and I ask you think about this in the Olympics silver or bronze medal winners who's happier well think about it who's going to be making an upward and a downward comparison silver medal winners are saying gee I almost have could have had gold that's an upward comparison and so they're going to be upset bronze medal winners are saying gee I could have almost not even placed at all so they're making downward comparisons and so they're happier and indeed uh, classic uh, this is uh, Michaela Baroni uh, at the 2012 Summer Olympics she was favored to be the gold medalist she got the silver medal and we know that she is not happy from that in fact an experiment actually tested that hypothesis and they did it in two ways they surveyed with a pencil and paper survey uh, you know Olympic medalists after they won and they found support for their hypothesis and another method is they had judges rate the happiness of medalists based on their facial expressions and the judges really didn't have to work hard to figure that one out so what causes counterfactual thinking uh, close calls increase counterfactuals uh, if I may miss the plane by one minute versus 35 minutes I'm going to make counterfactuals uh, there we go if I missed it by one minute but not by 35 you know, if I only didn't take time to brush my teeth I would have been on the plane unusual behaviors increase counterfactuals if I took a different route to the airport than normal why did I take that different route if I took the normal route I probably would have made it and controllability increases counterfactuals uh, you know why didn't I drive myself to the airport why did I trust ubers I would have more control if I drive and what's interesting is that rape victims are often more traumatized when they're raped at home than on the street and I'll allow you to think about that maybe for an exam question that is why are rape victims more traumatized if they're raped at home than on the street uh, thinking about controllability and counterfactuals uh, and also upward and downward comparisons so think about that and that's it for our lecture uh, when Michaela was honored by the president uh, he got in on the meme gee it's it's really sad to think about the fact that we don't have a fun president any longer but don't want to make this end a downer but okay hopefully this election will turn things around take care everybody 
Uh, I'll see you later.